Well, hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace. I thought I'd hop on here real quick of an evening, just kind of a spontaneous YouTube live to talk about a uh, CCNA topic. One of the new things about CCNA is that it's no longer focused on just routing and switching. Now it's more, it's more of an enterprise CCNA. And that means in addition to routing and switching, we've got things like wireless, we've got programmability, there's more security on there. We talk a little bit about cloud. It's more of an enterprise overview. Of, it's sort of a sampler platter, really, of different enterprise technologies. And I thought we would take a look tonight at one of the one of the more challenging topics that a lot of students have when it comes to wireless. And that is, how are the ones and zeros, how are they encoded? How are they transmitted? There's a lot of acronyms out there. We've got OFDM, OFDMA, and we're going to try to we're going to try to decipher a lot of that this evening. And I've got low battery and I'm on the outside, so I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible. But uh, let's talk about how we can encode ones and zeros. To go way back in time, if we look at... If we look at how we sent data with 802.11b, which sent data at the blazing speed of 11 megabits, not gigabits, 11 megabits per second. We had a 20, we had a 22 hertz channel width. And one bit can be sent with just two megahertz. There we go, 22 megahertz, that's better. 22 megahertz, one bit can be sent with just two megahertz. So you might think, hey, we can send 11 bits with this guy. But they were so concerned about error correction, they used an encoding scheme called Barker 11 encoding. And they were only sending one bit and using this entire 22 megahertz spectrum. Well, today it's a lot better. If we advance that a little bit, we can get into... Frequency division multiplexing, where we have we're just going to use 20 megahertz. We're not going to be greedy. And with this 22 megahertz, what we're going to do is we're going to divide this into sub channels. And by sub channels, I mean we can have a bit sent here and a bit sent here and on and on, <laughs> not drawn to scale, but each bit can be sent using just two megahertz. So there could be 10 bits that are going to be sent. Here's the challenge though. Even though these different sub channels are technically on different frequencies, I mean, come on, they're right next to each other. So there's going to be some interference. How do we get away from that interference in adjacent channels? Well, the answer is to have them at right angles to one another. There's a term you might remember from your high school math class called orthogonal. Orthogonal simply means at right angles to. For example, my arms right now are orthogonal to one another. They're at right angles to one another. And if you're at right angles to one another, there's no interference. It's kind of like looking at a uh, looking at a pool with a uh, pair of polarized sunglasses on. You don't see all that glare coming off the pool because it's coming in one orientation and your glasses are sort of scratched at a different orientation and it blocks that glare. And what we can do is use orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OFDM. In fact, that's what's used by 802.11n and 802.11ac. But here's a question. How do we send electrical waveforms at right angles to one another? Well, it's not as you might visualize. Let me explain. Let me get another piece of paper here. And let's consider, again, going back to your high school, maybe trigonometry class, you might remember that there was something called a sine wave that looks something like this. And we had it beginning at zero. I'm gonna have to tape that down. The wind's a little rough tonight. There we go. We had zero degrees. In the middle we had 180 degrees. We had 90 degrees here, 270 degrees, and 360 degrees to make sort of a full circle. That was a sine wave. But if you remember what a, a cosine wave looked like, it looked like this. It's 90 degrees shifted. It's called a phase shift. We're shifting the cosine wave 90 degrees. That means when we have a peak in our sine wave right here, 
notice what the cosine wave is. It's zero. And when we have a peak in the cosine wave right here, what's the sine wave? It's zero. So these are technically orthogonal to one another. They're 90 degrees apart from one another, and that's going to reduce or almost eliminate any interference in adjacent channels. They're phase shifted. Well, that's how we can send the bits, but here's the challenge. We, we've only got so much, so much bandwidth, so much spectrum available. How do we send more data? Well, let's think about this. We've learned here that we can adjust the, the phase of a waveform what else can we adjust about a waveform? Well, we can adjust how loud it is, its, its peak, its amplitude, how tall it is. So by adjusting its amplitude and its phase, we can specify exactly how it would appear on sort of a, a graph. Let me show you. Get this tape down again. Let's say that we had a grid like this and we've got 16 dots on this grid. Four quadrants, 16 dots total. 16 dots. Ask yourself, how many bits does it take to make up 16 different combinations? Four, two to the fourth power is 16. So what if we assigned a unique string of four bits to each of these dots. I'll just give you one example. Let's say that this bit right here, let's say it's one, one, zero, zero. And notice it's not as far away from the zero point as this is. So we'll say that its amplitude is 25% of the possible amplitude. And also it's at an angle. If we go around, this is at about 225 degrees. So by specifying a unique amplitude a, a t how tall a waveform is, and by specifying how many phase shifted degrees it is, we can, it's just like throwing darts at a dartboard. Imagine this is a dartboard, I'm throwing darts at it. If I were to, bam, hit that dot right there, you know what I could do? I could represent four, I could say this equals one, one, zero, zero. And I did a single waveform using just two megahertz. Think about that, we went from having to have uh, 11 of those two megahertz channels to represent one bit to frequency division multiplexing where we could have two, uh, two megahertz represent one bit and now we can have two megahertz represent four bits and this is just a basic example because I didn't want to draw more dots. This is something called QAM, Q-A-M. And specifically this is 16 QAM and QAM stands for Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. And as the metaphor, think of throwing darts at a dartboard. And what we're doing here is representing four bits by having 16 targets. And once you add more and more targets, it starts to look sort of like a star field. In fact, this thing is called a constellation because we get so many dots on it. Now, with our Wi-Fi networks, we don't, we don't even start at 16 QAM. We go way up, check this out. Let's take a look at some of our more recent Wi-Fi standards. Well, not even that, that recent, 802.11n, that goes way back to 2009. That, um, let's write the other ones up here, 802.11ac, and the brand new 802.11ax, also known as Wi-Fi 6. 802.11n, it uses, let's see, it, it uses eight QAM. Two raised to the power of eight is 256. In other words, we have 256 targets and we can represent eight bits by hitting one of those targets. With 802.11ac, we go up to, actually, let's see, six, two to the sixth power. Yeah, I may have those backwards, but I, I know that, um, yeah, I know that 802.11x, that's 10 QAM, and two raised to the power of 10 is 1,024. So that gives us 1,024 QAM. I think this eight QAM, I think that's actually dot, uh, dot 11ac, pardon me. But uh, I know the most recent one is 1,024 QAM, where we've got 10, uh, where we got 10 bits 
represented by hitting one of those dots in the constellation, one of those targets. So we've got so we've got our Wi-Fi access point like this. And by the way, this is a Cisco access point. And it's pretty cool the way it works. You can plug in these different radio cards in the back to make it .11ac or .11ax or .11n. But this is the radio card. You just sort of snap it in there and you screw it down. And this is the way that we're able to encode and the encoding, again, is done using quadrature amplitude, or excuse me, the, the encoding is done using orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, and the encoding is using QAM, but there's an exception. We talked a little bit about .11ax, or Wi-Fi 6. It doesn't use OFDM, it uses OFDMA. That's orthogonal frequency division multiple access. Check this out. This gives us a huge benefit above and beyond what we have with predecessors to this. With predecessors, I hate to say it, but it's true, earlier wireless standards, they operated kind of like a hub. In other words, we could only have one transmission from one antenna at any one time. We use something called CSMA-CA, not CD, but CA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Avoidance. So only one device could talk at a time. But, and that's because we were listening, is anybody talking? If we heard silence, then we think, okay, it's clear to send and we'll transmit our signal. The problem was we might have two wireless devices listening at the same time. They heard the same period of silence and they transmitted at the same time and bam, there was a collision and they had to retransmit. Well, with 802.11ax, also known as Wi-Fi 6, we don't have to do that because we're using OFDMA, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access. What this does, it uses something called a target wake time, or TWT. What this means is we've got our Wi-Fi access point like this guy, and when it's talking to all the devices that have registered with it, it's going to give them, to paraphrase Whitney Houston, it's gonna give them one moment in time. It's gonna tell them when it's their turn to transmit. So let's say we've got, our, we've got our access point, and I've got a laptop here, laptop here, laptop here, smartphone here. It's gonna say, all right, it's your turn, go. It's your turn, your turn's coming up now, your turn's coming up now. So by giving everybody their own time to transmit, by giving their own device, then we eliminate this whole need for CSMACA, or at least we dr dramatically reduce it. Now. With this approach, we get another benefit besides just collision avoidance. If this guy right here knows that, all right, I'm gonna be transmitting in, in five milliseconds, you know what it can do? It says, all right, I'm not doing anything now. I cannot do anything for another several milliseconds, so I'm gonna go into a low power mode. That's right. By using 802.11ax, we can actually save power by sort of powering down, going into a low power mode with our wireless cards because we know we're not gonna be transmitting or receiving right now, it's not our turn. And that's just a, a, a few of the ways that we get some incredible throughput with 802.11ax uh, 802 or Wi-Fi 6. And we're, we have speeds in the range of about, uh, of about 10 gigabits per second wirelessly. Pretty amazing stuff. And I wanted to share this because this is one of those topics that a lot of CCNA candidates, they get into it and it just kinda what? That's that. Uh, we weren't ready for this because I'm a. By the way, I'm a huge fan of Cisco's new CCNA certification. I love what they've done. They've made it more of an enterprise certification. But one of the challenges is a lot of people are missing some of the fundamentals. It's almost like the expectation is you come into the CCNA class with a little bit of background. You know, you've worked with networks maybe for one or two years, and that's a challenge for people that are just getting into IT. So here's the deal. I thought what I would do is create a free class. I'm gonna be doing it next week, and it's called CCNA CCNA Foundations. This is a live class that I run once a year. When I ran it last year, we had over 4,000 register for it. It's the best attended live event that I've, that I've ever done and you're invited to attend for free. It's next week, it's next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Here's the link to sign up. Just go to K, 
W train T R A I N dot com slash foundations. Again, that's kwtrain.com slash foundations. You'll get more information about the exact times and dates, and you'll be able to register there. You'll be able to get more details about it there, and uh, you'll see another video kind of, kind of introducing it. But again, totally free. I wanna help you get ready for your CCNA studies, because if you've got less than two years of, of I mean, not just two years of experience, but, but real day-to-day hands-on experience in the industry, there's a lot of gaps that you need to fill in before really going for your CCNA, and I want to help you fill those. I would be honored if you would entrust me with 12 hours of your time next week. We're going to go for four hours a day. We're going to go for total immersion. We're going to go four hours a day, three days in a row, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and you're going to come out of that, you're going to come out of that with a solid foundation ready to tackle your CCNA studies. And something that I haven't advertised yet, you're also going to come out with, come out of that certification or come out of that training ready to take your CompTIA Network Plus exam because we're covering pretty much as part we're covering pretty much every topic in CompTIA's Network Plus exam and I want to have fun with this so what I've done I've partnered with uh, Todd Lamley and he's been gracious enough to to give his awesome CCNA books for the new CCNA and each day Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday we're going to be giving a giveaway of one or two of Todd Lamley's books and you got to be live to uh, you got to be there live if you want to be a winner and we'll leave this up for a few days. We'll leave it up probably through Friday of next week. Then we're going to take it down. But um, you got to be there live to get the giveaway. You got to be there live to ask me your questions. We'll have plenty of Q&A opportunities. Please let me serve you like this. If you're new into IT, if you've got your site set on CCNA, you need a solid foundation to build on your studies or for your studies to build on. So if you would entrust me beginning next Tuesday, it's going to be at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You can register at kwtrain.com slash foundations. Totally free. Hope to see you there. Thank you for joining me for a few minutes this evening, and I hope to see you in our CCNA Foundations training next week. Take good care, everyone.